Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Park Forum. Uh, I'm Amy Hallman. I direct the marketing team here at Park, um, and I'm very pleased to be hosting another forum this afternoon. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome our very own Dr. Victoria Bellotti, presenting Random Acts of Kindness, the Future of Digital Altruism, Community Collaboration, and Time Banks. I think it's gonna be a really great uh, talk today. Uh, on Vic's uh, research in mobile, intelligent, and context-aware computing systems enabling transformative innovation on the societal level. Victoria is a principal scientist in our innovation services group where she's developed our Opportunity Discovery Strategic Investment Targeting Program. Vic also studies people to understand their practices, problems, and requirements for future technology and she designs and analyzes human-centered systems focusing on the user experience. So without further ado, let's welcome Vic Bilotti. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. So is the mic on? Can you hear me all right? Yes, okay, great, okay. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today to talk about this subject because it's something I've become very passionate about in a short space of time, and that's uh, time banks which means uh, it's a system for sort of formalizing reciprocal altruism or service exchanges. And I'm gonna explain what that's about, but this is uh, based on a collaboration that I've been engaged in since uh, October of 2012 with uh, John Carroll and his student Kyung Sik, or he goes by Keith Han, and they're at Penn State University. And uh, so we're all working together uh, uh, to research this area. What I'm gonna do here today is to explain the concept of time banking, and then I'm gonna give you a little bit of its history because I think it's interesting. And then I'm gonna talk about the, the main meat of the presentation. So that is looking for opportunities for uh, context-aware and smart technologies to really turbocharge time banking and make it very uh, engaging, very popular, hopefully something that everybody will do in the future. So uh, I put random acts of uh, kindness in the title uh, just to sort of conjure up where I think the technology can take this practice of reciprocal altruism that's organized. And that is uh, so that anybody essentially should be able to, on the fly, express a need. And if somebody else out there is better positioned to uh, service that need, provide uh, a quick service, maybe a, uh, pick up something for the grocery store, that task will be diverted to them on the fly. So that, if you imagine, if that was working all the time with all of us, the world would be a great, you know, very efficient place, I think, a lot, lot less errand running going on. So, uh, so now I just want to explain what time banking is. So um, if you do a Google search for time banking, you'll actually find out that it's a fairly well-established concept. Uh, in the last few decades, I think it's sort of gathering momentum, but uh, it, it has been around for a while. And uh, so I want to explain what the concept is. So very, put as simply as I can get it. It's a system of credits that represent the time used by one person to provide a service to another person. And it provides a way to store and exchange the credits so that if you earn credits, you can later spend them on something else. So you don't have to exchange with only one person. You can exchange with anyone in the community. And it provides a way to discover the requests and offers that are out there in the community from people who want to trade. So that's essentially what it is. And it's uh, just one form of what we call um, um, you know, uh, alternative currency. And the nice thing about this, though, is that uh, it has, uh, it's a bit different from some of the others in that it's uh, uh, not including, uh, it only focuses on services provided. So that means that uh, it doesn't have monetary value, a service, until somebody says how much it's actually they want to be paid for it. So, so far, the IRS has never taxed it. So that means, I mean, the IRS has not made a ruling and says we're never going to tax it, but they haven't taxed it so far, which means that the value that it provides stays in the community. And because time banking makes use of this resource of time on people's hands, what happens is that it's really great at insulating communities from economic downturns. So when the money supply and the job supply runs out, people are not sitting by idly. They can actively contribute to the community uh, and stuff gets done. Value is created and it stays in the community. Now, there are uh, other kinds of uh, uh, alternative 
currencies out there. So uh, Bitcoin has had a lot of attention lately. Uh, so this is a currency where uh, it's backed by its uh, difficulty of being uh, 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 counterfeited. There's a limited supply, and it cuts out the middleman. So you can do anything with Bitcoin, and uh, nobody's going to catch you. Well, I imagine well, that's what the value is. Probably the government doesn't want that to be the case. Um, so then uh, there are other alternative currencies, though, that are more traditional in nature. And uh, you might have heard of uh, some of them. So there's uh, the Swiss weir, which has been a around for a long time. Uh, I, I forget how many decades now. Uh, there's Ithaca Hours, Pennsylvania dollars, and Massachusetts Berkshires. So these are all local currencies, which is a subset of, uh, of alternative currencies that are backed by local resources, which could be anything. Uh, cabbages, haircuts, whatever it is anybody is w willing to back the currency with. <clears throat> so, uh, as I said, time banking only focuses on the services side of things and not uh, things that are objects that can be bought and sold, which makes it a little bit different. And it also means that time banking necessarily involves the coordination of services, which is very interesting to me uh, because I'm interested in collaborative technologies and that this sort of brings in some of that uh, uh, research interest for me personally. So uh, I want to give you a little scenario so it really drives home what it means. So let's imagine uh, Alice, right, she has uh, rheumatoid arthritis, has a very great difficulty gardening, so uh, she would like to have somebody help her, but she doesn't know any gardeners. But fortunately, there's somebody called Bob who lives nearby, who is a member of the Time Bank and has a whole set of uh, gardening tools. And Bob loves to garden for people, so he puts his profile up on the Time Bank. And so Alice goes to the Time Bank's website and sees that Bob does yard work, and she says, can you... Uh, spend three hours, uh, she sends him a request, uh, say, come on Saturday for three hours. Bob gets the request and says, oh, yes, I can do that. And so he shows up, does the yard, and everything's lovely. Now, he doesn't have to then uh, ask Alice to do something for him. So he has, a, he has another need. So his dog, Fifi, uh, is stuck at home while he's out gardening. And so uh, Bob can go on the time bank and look for a dog walker and use the hours that he's earned from the gardening and pay Lisa to walk his dog for him. OK, so that's how it works. It just goes around. And now uh, I also want to uh, say that uh, there's another aspect to this, of course, that means that one person can't earn more than another. If you're a lawyer or a gardener, you're going to earn the same in a time bank. Um, and, but this is also, uh, many of the people who participate in time banking claim that this actually adds to the value. It's extremely egalitarian. People love that element of it, even though maybe some economists may say this may, may be a problem. I just want to uh, uh, let you hear from some of the people at Sobrante Park, which is a, a time bank near where I live in Oakland, and, and let them tell you what they think of it. So, oh, Banking in its down. model would work for this community. There's not a lot of money in this community, but to barter services and to have people understand what that means, right. I think it's important. It's a fabulous model. What, what do you think of the concept of time banking? What it well, does? I love it. I think that exchange for goods and services, um, whether it's there's no monetary value. It's yeah. extremely, uh, extremely important, but I think it's also beneficial. Uh, people always, it's, it's an old trade. People always need services for something else. Yeah. And this kind of uh, establishes a lot of neighborhood building and yeah. uh, you know, helping out your fellow food person next door to you is great. We do things for each other, which is very nice. You don't have to pay anyone. Right. You're just serving them with our time. What's the most valuable thing about oh, the time value? Is, the value is um, it's that everybody is same. It's every, every, every service, any service is it's same. Yeah. It's no more uh, computer, uh, the clean up, yeah. or make it right. It's, it, it's hour to hour. It's yeah. hour for hour. It's no, no, no money. It's, it's no money for, for, for the program. Okay. So uh, now I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, it's not, as I said, time banking is not something that's been around for a long time. It's not something that's totally dependent on modern technology. In fact, I've been doing a bit of digging, and I actually found out that uh, this chap, Josiah Warren, who's an interesting character because he was an innovator and he was also possibly the first anarchist, uh, in 1827, he created something called the Cincinnati Time Store. 
and people could go to the store and use notes that equated to uh, you know, the uh, value of some uh, labor in terms of time, and they could buy goods in terms of the time that it cost to produce them, plus a small surcharge which went towards the running of the store. And this was successful for two years until uh, Josiah decided that he wanted to go off and try more ambitious social experiments. Meanwhile, not to be outdone, uh, in the UK, where I come from, uh, an associate of uh, Josiah's, Robert Owen, set up something which had a much more English name, the National Equitable Labor Exchange. And, uh, and this was set up again on similar principles. So people would exchange labor notes to purchase things that they needed. And so everything resolved to the value of the, the time that was taken to produce something. Uh, so it's a little bit different from time banking today, but uh, a very similar principle. And uh, this particular experiment lasted for about a year until, unfortunately, uh, it devolved into fights about the value, uh, how much time it took to produce goods and services and how much time people had earned. And uh, so I was, uh, would say, you know, if they'd had the technology that we have today, I think that this kind of experiment would have been a lot more successful because it helps to keep track of stuff much better. Um, so in the Great Depression uh, in the United States around Los Angeles County, uh, there was residents started organizing what they called self-help cooperatives uh, where they would uh, barter labor for the goods that they were producing. So they would exchange you know, their time in, in harvesting a crop and they would get some of the crop in return for it. And this uh, ended up providing a lot of families uh, about 60 to 70 percent, 75 percent of the goods that they actually needed. Again, a similar principle of, uh, of using time as value. Uh, but the modern conception of time banking, which is the one that I've been describing where there's no goods exchange, just services, really comes from somebody called Edgar Kahn. And so he's a, a distinguished professor and a social innovator. And he's been credited with coining the term time banking and time dollars. And he was working at the London School of Economics in the 1980s. And his work on uh, this kind of new forms of uh, credit exchange, social uh, contracts, and so on, led to some funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that allowed them to uh, uh, provide funds for six uh, service uh, credit exchange programs uh, around the United States. And uh, so one of these uh, was at Grace Hill Settlement House in St. Louis. And uh, in this place, I actually did a bit of digging here too. And it became pretty clear that you know, there's, this place had, had a very long history of informal service exchanges. And that uh, activity was led by somebody called Betty Renee Marva from the 70s onwards. So even before Edgar showed up, <clears throat> there were people engaged in this kind of reciprocal altruistic practice. But uh, what Edgar did was formalize this, uh, this idea of having a bank and having the time dollars. And he, he says that it was uh, actually Ralph Nader who told him to get rid of the term service exchange and use uh, time dollars and time banking because it was more catchy. <clears throat> and so as Edgar became involved, so Grace Hill started formally tracking the hours uh, in 1981. And then uh, they changed their name to a member organized resource exchange in 83. And then by 1985, they started using a computer-based system to track the hours. So uh, over the last uh, 25, 30 years, uh, lots of experimentation and expansion. There are now time banks all over the USA. There's thought to be about uh, uh, three, 300 in the USA. The smallest has about 15 members. And the largest, which is the Visiting Nurse Service of New York, has 3,000 members. Second largest is in Dane County and has 2,500. In Europe, uh, the picture's even brighter. There seem to be even more time banks. So just in the UK alone, there's about 30,000 time bankers, and they're in about 250 time banks. Uh, in Spain, there's 300 time banks. And um, around the world, there's about 100,000 people thought to be engaged in time banking. Again, this is an estimate, so it's very hard to tell because not all time banks are registered and, and announcing that they're, uh, you know, widely that what they're doing. But um, so there has been uh, some expansion. A lot of people who are researching this area sort of see this as a rising trend. And um, one of the reasons for this is probably because it's getting, as well as being able to put technology and drive it around on Mars, we've actually been able to develop platforms that make the building of the software that supports time banking much easier. Uh, so there are uh, open source platforms like Drupal uh, that make uh, social media development very much more simple. Uh, another force that's actually operating here is also the economic situation. So 
no surprises, you know, that there, there's been challenges lately. Uh, unemployment has uh, risen. Uh, what's called the participation rate, which is the ratio of the uh, population who could work, who were even registering for work uh, or are working, is going down. And the proportion of the uh, population that's actually, uh, or, or did go down, I should say, maybe going up again, the proportion of the population that's uh, um, engaged in working has also been uh, down, and it was down at about 59%. Uh, at, the, at the beginning of uh, this year, I think, or the end of last year. Um, so these figures uh, uh, mean that there's a lot of people who have time on their hands and they also don't have enough money. Uh, it doesn't even take into account that 15 million people also are only working part-time. So uh, these are perfect conditions for time banking where you know, people have time on their hands and they would like to contribute something. Um, so, uh, yes, that, that seems to have be been a, like a major issue, and in fact, it led to uh, a news coverage of what was going on in Greece uh, a couple of years ago by RT.com, and I just want to play you part of their news article about what time banking was doing in Greece. They say that time is money, but for a country where cash is now in short supply, time has taken on a whole different value. In the time bank, we exchange voluntary services. Sometimes I give painting lessons for free, but they take yoga for free also. Somebody else is teaching yoga. The time bank's just one of a growing number of service swapping alternatives that are providing people in Greece another way to cope with the tough economic conditions. Services can include anything from language classes to babysitting or home-cooked meals. It's huge. It's huge. It's everything we do without money, like looking after people or making things by ourselves. For a country in crisis, building social unity can prove extremely hard. Crisis is a terrible thing. It, it creates fear. It divides people uh, from public sector workers to from private sector workers. It divides richer workers to poorer workers, uh, immigrant workers from home workers. And that's a terrible thing. But the Barton Networks have been a great way of bringing together large groups of people a popular slogan here in Greece now is, no one's alone in the crisis. Organisations are arranging swap shops to exchange clothes, and one town in Greece has even started its own barter currency. Okay, so um, obviously uh, it's been great for Greece where there's been a lot of challenges, the, the economy practically collapsed there, but I want to emphasise that it's not just economically deprived places that have time banks. Uh, to illustrate that, this is a picture from the Bay Area Community Exchange. Uh, so that's up in San Francisco. And this is a photograph from a member who actually had a, a quilt made by the Time Bank. So, uh, and the story behind this is actually a perfect example of what Time Banks are good for, which is not just providing services, but also making connections. So this person talked about uh, seeing a friend of his had a, t uh, a, a duvet cover made out of T-shirts. And so he thought, oh, great, I'll get the Time Bank to do that. So he connected with somebody in the time bank uh, who said, bring over the t-shirts and cotton and various things. So he took the stuff over and then got talking to this woman and discovered that, in fact, they had a mutual friend in common. So he just hung out for a while and they became friends. And so you know, a new social connection was formed. And that happens a lot with time banking. Uh, so that brings us up to time banking today. And then I just wanted to mention in a little bit more detail what my personal interest in time banking springs from, and, and that's in relation to this project that I've been uh, working on with uh, Jack Carroll and, and Keith Hahn. So we're collaborating to develop a mobile time banking app. It may surprise you to know that there really isn't one out there, so the major time banks don't have a mobile app. Now, there are little attempts to set, one, uh, set up mobile time banking apps, but they're not integrated with the existing platforms. They, tend to go away again. So we've actually developed a mobile app. Uh, it's been tested on students in uh, Penn State. We're actually integrating it with one of the apps, uh, one of the uh, uh, platforms right now. But I don't want to talk about that today. Sorry to disappoint you. Um, what I want to talk about is sort of looking ahead, because I can't wait to talk about that stuff, uh, based on the interviews and, and the observations that we've doing, been doing. So I, we've interviewed about 50 people at this point about uh, time banking and what it's good for and how it works and so on. And from those interviews, we've learned a lot about um, what the challenges are and what the opportunities are in this space. And so that's really what I wanted to communicate to people. This is kind of a rallying cry to innovators. Hey, there's a great opportunity here to improve this, uh, this practice. And um, you know, it really needs help, because it's not all plain sailing for uh, time banking these days. It has 
some significant challenges. And I just want to uh, uh, touch on those before I dive into the opportunities. So the first one is cash. So uh, time banks are uh, usually volunteer organizations. They're set up often by individuals. Uh, they're certainly uh, not obtaining a lot of funding from any other source. Uh, so the people who work for the time banks are often volunteers. Um, and it's a lot of work to run a time bank. And uh, one of the major reasons why time banks die is because the volunteers burn out. So that's a big problem. Um, and then another issue is that uh, legacy systems is a problem. So uh, of course, there's, this is a grassroots movement. And so there have been lots of people uh, working on developing platforms to support it. So uh, Time Banks uh, USA is the granddaddy time banking uh, entity. Uh, a new organization, Our World, uh, has, has sprung up. And those are the two big ones in the United States. Uh, but it's not true all over the world. And in fact, I keep stumbling across new time banking platforms that I won't uh, go into here. Suffice it to say that none of them talks to one another. And uh, you can have time banks on different platforms very close to each other. And you can't do an exchange across uh, those uh, systems. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more when I talk about opportunities. But you can see there's an obvious one here. Another uh, challenge is the, uh, the communities that the time banks are often uh, doing the most good for often have uh, problems of fragmentation and uh, lack of connection across these uh, cultural divides. And so Sobranti Park's a great example because uh, half of the population here is Spanish speaking. And so uh, whenever they have an event, uh, or when they're staffing the uh, office where they take phone calls and uh, they do some of the offers and requests management by phone here, by the way, um, you see that they have to have double the staff. They have to have a Spanish speaker and they have to have an English speaker on staff. And that obviously adds to the overheads. Um, another issue with this uh, particular time bank and many time banks is the, uh, the age gap. So a lot of people in this time bank are rather elderly. And younger people, uh, as one person actually directly confessed to me, are a little put off by joining an organization that is full of octogenarians, you know, if they're like a teenager. <clears throat> OK, so um, I would, would say, though, that uh, some of these challenges are things that time banks, actually, if they're well run and they're successful, uh, can do a reasonably good job of, of handling. So the shortages of cash, obviously, the time bank can pay people in terms of hours. Uh, that doesn't uh, solve all problems, but in a really big time bank, uh, that usually means you can get a lot done, you know, because there are plumbers and all sorts of people who will accept uh, time banking hours, so you can save your money on other things. Uh, and developers sometimes will even uh, actually take hours in exchange for their services, which is great. Uh, the developers themselves are working to overcome those technical barriers that I mentioned. And then another thing is that time banks themselves are really good at bridging cultural divides. And in fact, you'll find a lot of people, for example, in Sobranti Park, say that it's done great things for bringing the community together, uh, when traditionally these two, the African-American community and the Spanish-speaking community there have not seen eye to eye with each other at all. OK, so now I want to talk about uh, tomorrow's possibilities. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I think that time bank banking, obviously, all the problems will not be solved by technology, but technology can go a long way towards making things easier. Uh, it could make it more viral, more engaging, more fun. Uh, it could reduce the burdens on those volunteers who keep burning out. And what I want to convince you of in this talk is that there are possibilities. I mean, if we get it right, you know, we could make time banking as exciting and fun and as engaging and possibly as addictive as Facebook. That's, that's what I'm aiming at anyway. So uh, in the rest of my talk, I want to divide uh, the issues, the opportunities that I'm going to present to you into two clumps. So the first clump is related to the organizational or system elements. So uh, you know, what's the sort of uh, uh, social context that makes the time bank work? And then uh, the transaction elements, so the bits and pieces that need to be in place for somebody to actually do a service exchange with somebody. Uh, so let me start with, uh, by talking about the, uh, the community and li a little tiny digression. So um, Gillian Seifang, who's one of the foremost researchers in the field of time banking, um, has pointed out that time banks often uh, fail uh, if they are not attached to a pre-existing organization. So uh, if a time bank is attached to something like a, a hospital or a church or a school, it has a much better chance of surviving. And the reason for that is because 
um, those organizations already have paid staff or, or people who are committed for life to the, uh, the aims of the organization they're a part of. And the time bank often serves those needs. So in the case of uh, 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 Allen, uh, there's an Allentown uh, health network. It's the Lehigh Health Network. So in that case, they have a time bank because one of the great things the time bank does is provides transportation for people to and from their doctor's appointments. Uh, and it also provides some care services and things like that. Uh, in the case of the Sobrante Park uh, uh, community, so they're uh, attached to a church. And so that church has requirements for maintenance of the grounds and uh, the upkeep of the building. And, and so people will do that for hours. And so this lady actually gardens uh, around the church just in exchange for hours. But uh, nonetheless, these time banks, even, the, even though they're often attached to another organization, they have their own separate entities. They have this sort of like uh, certain things that they need to have in, of themselves organized and sorted out in order to exist. And so these are the things that I want to talk about, the community, the roles, and the infrastructure. And I'm going to start with the uh, community. So uh, when we think about the community and opportunities there, um, we have to remember that the communities that often benefit the most from time banking are often economically uh, deprived communities. So uh, there may be members of that community, and so Bransy Park, again, is a really good example. There are people there who don't have smartphones. Some of them don't even have mobile phones. Some of them don't have email accounts to the point where, uh, in order to use the software, the organizers of the time bank had to fake up a bunch of accounts and make up email addresses for people. So it's a really good thing that I went and talked to those people before I tried to recruit people to participate in my study by mailing those email addresses because I wouldn't have got very far. So, um, so that means that, you know, like when we, we were interviewing people, we were thinking, well, dang, you know, like well, how do we, uh, uh, you know, affect the lives of these people who really need time banking, but they don't have a smartphone, and we want to make, you know, a fancy mobile smartphone app. So what could we do? And, you know, it became obvious that it would be great, like, if we could just have a proxy account, so one person who represents a bunch of other people. So that could be somebody who works in a, a neighborhood center of some sort or a teacher in a school. And that person would know the strengths and weaknesses or the superpowers of the people that they represent and then uh, also would know what kinds of opportunities would be good for those people. So if they thought, well, this child, you know, could really learn, uh, you know, gardening, that would be a great skill to have. Uh, direct that task to that particular person. And so, um, you know, that's, that's a very simple fix just for this uh, uh, really obvious and major problem. Because when, right at the beginning of our study, we were, we were very worried about this idea that we were developing a mobile app and the people who needed it the most didn't actually have a smartphone. So that deals with that hopefully to some extent. Um, another uh, issue that I mentioned before is these uh, uh, the chasms or disconnects in communities. So, uh, you know, most communities have these groups of people who don't want to interact with each other for one reason or another. And a time bank has this great potential to sort of make connections, arbitrary p connections between people around services. And so it's sort of like a trellis work that relationships can grow over, hopefully. And so we were thinking that, you know, it might be a great opportunity here to proactively assist with forming more relationships of a over, through a community that wouldn't normally happen. And uh, so borrowing from uh, dating sites, uh, we could actually imagine how a time bank could be a little more intelligent about this than uh, just allowing people to choose for themselves. So uh, this is uh, OkCupid, okay and what it has is a, a matching algorithm that gives you the probability of your uh, chances of being a romantic match with uh, the person that you're looking at, or just a friend, or an enemy. And that's based on uh, questions which are crowdsourced, things like, uh, you know, do you, like, uh, uh, do you own a dog, or you think it's a good idea to own a dog, or should, chil should uh, people have children out of wedlock? Sometimes the questions are very provoking, and they look at the answers and see if the answers are compatible and then match people on that basis. So this is great. You know, we could do stuff like this. Um, so uh, are my slides not advancing? Oh, no. All right. I may have a machine crash problem. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, there we go. It suddenly woke up. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so yeah. So imagine that uh, you have, uh, like, you know, like Sobranti Park wants to involve kids. They have a lot of older people. Uh, so when kids join the time bank, 
uh, you could do some preferential matching and only match kids with other kids. Uh, you could do it with anybody, right? Only match people who are demographically like themselves. But then over time, as they start forming friendships in the time bank and start uh, you know, becoming more committed, you can engage in a little bit of benign social engineering and be a bit more daring. So you might find another point of contact, like uh, you could find a kid who's just getting into the Rolling Stones and connect them with a veteran fan who's actually been to many of their gigs and they'll have something to talk about, right? Um, and so, you know, you would find that information potentially on people's uh, profiles. You could ask them to put in more information into their profile page, or uh, you could actually scrape it from social media if you could connect people's accounts uh, in the time bank to, say, Facebook or Twitter and just gradually build up an interest uh, profile for that person. So uh, that's something that uh, I think is a little further down the road but will be very interesting. And I want to say more about integrating with... Uh, social media later on in the talk. Uh, my final point under the theme of community is a, a fairly surprising one. So, um, you know, a lot of people, who, when you first think about a time bank and there is nobody policing a time bank and there's this issue, well, what about freeloaders? So, you know, the people who join the time bank and just say, hey, this is great, come and do my garden and why don't you, you know, prune my trees and you can, like, fix my plumbing. And they freeload, they never contribute anything. But oddly enough, it's totally the opposite way around. In fact, the problem is that there is a lot of people who have lots of uh, positive credit in their uh, account, and there's, there's this sort of unfreeloader problem. There are not enough people who are asking for help with things, including the elderly, or in fact, especially the elderly. They talk about enjoying helping other people rather than being helped themselves. So, you know, this was having us scratching our heads a little bit because it's a really pervasive and quite well-recognized problem that researchers have noticed with time banks. And uh, so when we sort of probed a little further, what we're finding is that, you know, a lot of people have this idea that uh, participating in a time bank is a way to do good for the community. It's to help people. And, of course, you know, uh, that's an act of charity or kindness. But when you m make the metaphor of an e economic transaction, it sort of takes everything away from that. And people feel, oh, so in that case, now I'm just doing it for the hours. Well, that doesn't feel so good. So that's one issue. Um, and another one, which is sort of more tightly bound to this metaphor of banking, is the fact that nobody wants to go into a negative balance because we've got such, you know, cultural... Uh, uh, negative associations there that we don't want to be overdrawn. And in fact, even some time banks try to police the positives and the negatives in people's accounts and don't let them get too much in credit or too much in debt. So, you know, there may be some design work that needs to be done here to sort of move away a little bit from the metaphor of banking and more into sort of like uh, thinking of it as a, some sort of local sort of social support network builder or something like that. And so, you know, I think here this is a very interesting design space about how to get this right. And it's really more about what conceptual model you present to the, uh, the user more than about, you know, any technical uh, thing that's going on at the back end. <clears throat> okay, the second thing uh, I want to talk about is the roles uh, that are involved in running a time bank. So uh, this is a flyer from uh, the health fair that happened this year. Uh, this is an annual event for Sobrante Park. And this is a big deal for them. I mean, you can barely talk to them in the weeks running up to this because they're all sort of feeling terribly overloaded. It takes a lot of people to run that event, uh, to set it up, to plan it. This is not all of the people who are actually involved in the meeting, uh, one of the meetings prior to the event. So there's a big group of people there. Um, this is a photo taken of half of the folks who were in a, a Bay Area community exchange meeting. And uh, so this was a meeting to uh, mainly to discuss uh, running an off-site or a, a retreat to discuss time bank business. So there's a lot of talking, a lot of planning that needed to happen. So they typically have, you know, somebody who's in a director role, they have administrators, maybe somebody's uh, dealing with any financial issues, uh, expenses that the time bank might have. Uh, the Sobranti Park Place has coordinators who uh, substitute for people who won't use the web because they don't have an internet uh, access. So they use the phone and people have to mon uh, staff the phone. Uh, time banks, we've been told, really require people to, to do promotion and outreach, and that's really missing. They also require training. 
so there's a big issue is that you know people often tend to reinvent the wheel because these are grassroots uh, organizations and so you know people keep making the same mistakes and I've met several people who've done training who just say you know it's a terrible we really really need more trainers there just aren't enough of us and so people keep making mistakes so uh, what we need really is some kind of support for uh, sharing knowledge and so people don't have to keep uh, reinventing the wheel, making mistakes, and making life harder for themselves and burning out sooner. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking that there's opportunities here for uh, learning technologies, but I'm not thinking about, you know, coursework or manuals. I'm thinking about something that's a bit more like a, a distributed or crowdsourced approach. And funnily enough, uh, there was a very old example of such a, an approach which we had at uh, Xerox and a uh, park back in the late 80s, I think it was. Um, Julian Orr, who was an anthropologist here, uh, was studying service technicians, uh, Xerox service technicians, <coughs> out on the job looking at the copiers and printers, and then coming back and sort of hanging out with each other and talking about their work. And what he noticed was that they were exchanging war stories so they would say, oh, you know, I discovered that this little part here, if you did this thing and bent some wire and then stuck that in, it would last another 10 years. So they would tell these stories about how to fix things, but there was nothing in the manuals or the uh, training guidelines to cover this information. It was sort of lost, and so you only got it communicated virally through the network. And he thought, you know, oh, this is really interesting. And, and the technicians at, Z at Park were saying, oh, great, we can make a system that will share that information. And so this was the... Uh, genesis of this system called Eureka, and Eureka had a kind of complete listing of all of the possible parts in a printer or a copier, and then uh, people were encouraged to attach their war stories to these parts, so that then somebody else who was like encountering a, a, a failure in a part of a copier, they didn't recognize the cause of it, they could go to Eureka, look up that part, and see what other people had said. And you know, usually when something went wrong on one machine, it had a tendency to go wrong on other machines. So pretty soon, you'd have a lot of luck looking these things up. And, and people would just contribute these stories for social capital, you know, the, just the, the, the pride of actually being able to contribute to the community's knowledge base. <clears throat> and this is not just a research uh, prototype, as I say, it's actually in use. It's, it's thought that this has saved Xerox about $30 million a year in not having to replace copiers or parts of copiers. And so, you know, it's had a huge value for Xerox. So obviously, you know, this is hardware, but you could imagine how in a time banking setting, you know, there are certain things that need to be done and people could contribute stories about how to run a health fair, how to do outreach, you know, how to provide training, uh, how to get somebody on board as an organizer, all sorts of things that could be looked up, that could either be searched or uh, browsed by uh, newcomers who would then learn a lot that way. Finally, uh, the software issue that I wanted to get to as well, as I was telling you before, all of these different platforms. When we started doing our research about with this mobile app, we wanted to be able to talk to these existing backends. We didn't want to mo make a mobile app and then have the job of starting our own time bank to use it. And we didn't know which one to talk to because there were so many of them and you know, their user base goes up and down. So we were very worried at the beginning of this project, but we just got lucky with the timing time here because there's actually a group of people who are in the different uh, time banking communities who are all talking together uh, at the moment. It's uh, something was started by the director of the Dane County Time Bank. Uh, her name's Stephanie Rierick, uh, and she's a real dynamo, and she has done a lot to kind of push forward uh, uh, growing the agenda for time banking and trying to make it more successful. And so uh, this community is formed and they're all talking to each other and it includes a lot of techno geeks who uh, are trying to plan ways for these different uh, time, time banks to exchange information and have a, a common exchange. Uh, maybe there's a single uh, API uh, that everybody can uh, exchange information in terms of. And this was great for us because we showed up just as this was happening and we got connected with them. And so uh, our mobile app has actually been a catalyst for moving this along at a higher speed as well. So our ultimate uh, ideal outcome is to be able to talk to all of the back ends, and that's what we're hoping will, will gradually happen. I don't want you to focus on details here. I just wanted to use this just to show you that people are really seriously thinking about this issue of how to get the time banks to talk to one another. 
And I don't want to restrict it only to time banks as well. I think we live in really interesting times in terms of systems that are similar to time banking, if not just time banking itself. So systems that are sort of disrupting the way that labor is organized or that uh, economic exchanges take place. So there's things that go like from social credit. This is something we're experimenting with a part called Merit Share. Most of you have probably heard of TaskRabbit, where it has a sort of core of vetted uh, uh, TaskRabbits who will, you can employ to do little tasks for you. Um, there is uh, Lyft, uh, which is uh, a way of sharing rides. It's sort of just time banking for just rides. So a whole bunch of these things are springing up. And uh, of course, you know, they're all incompatible right now, which I think is pretty stupid. I think we should, they, they should actually be able to share content. And so if you create a profile in one thing, maybe in Facebook, you know, that should be able to be used everywhere, right? Um, you, know, you shouldn't have to duplicate that effort. If you earn credit in one system, it should be worth something somewhere else, or reputation. There are many common factors across these systems, I think, that I think over time will, will become uh, uh, data that can be traded between systems. And so I'd rather see people working on solving that problem than making yet another system that does some new kind of cultural, uh, uh, financial, or economic exchange. And uh, one of the things that people could do with that extra time they save would be to develop a user experience or an interface for people who have uh, limitations that make interacting with systems difficult. Now, you know, these kinds of people who have uh, some kind of physical challenge or a cognitive challenge, often they have a huge amount to contribute. And so, you know, we want to make systems that allow them to participate in time banking because they need help and they can offer help to other people. So uh, better uh, user experience for uh, those kinds of people, I think, would be uh, great. And this also includes uh, elderly people who maybe have vision problems and hearing problems. I'm heading right there myself, so I'm hoping a lot's going to happen here soon. OK, so now I want to talk about the transaction elements. And uh, so uh, I'll just leap in and start with the first one, advertising needs and services. So currently, with existing software, you know, you browse and you can look through all of these different posts that people put up. This is our world. And um, so what you're looking at here is some uh, real posts that are anonymized. And if you had a very active time bank, say like Dane County, you'd just be overwhelmed with the amount of content there. So you need to categorize it. And that's what they do is they have offers separate, separated from requests. And then they're subcategorized into areas that then you might be interested in. So you have a much smaller set of things to browse. Uh, in the Bay Area Community Exchange, they actually uh, proactively look at your profile and match it to uh, 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 offers and requests that are coming out, and then they post you uh, something that you might be interested in. So they're actually reaching out to you uh, if you're a member of their time bank. But I think that even if you aren't a member of the time bank, you should somehow be able to see what's on offer and what's going on in the time bank. So I think it would be great if we could actually uh, scrape the web and get content out of the web and sort of put it in the time bank if people are making requests in any environment, might be on Facebook, might be somewhere else, and vice versa, post stuff. Facebook isn't particularly good because it's not localized. Uh, but there are things like uh, iNeighbor, meetup.com, nextdoor.com. This is my nextdoor.com, uh, my neighborhood. Uh, so a lot of people in that neighborhood very actively uh, communicating and actually making offers and requests all the time. And that should be, be possible to go into and come out of a time bank. Uh, not only would it make the time bank uh, activities more visible to the outside, but it would also uh, make the time bank a more interesting place to go if you could actually sort of go in there and see uh, just a condensed and well-organized uh, collection of all of the things that are being asked and offered in the community. Another thing we might do is uh, not just do uh, text uh, scraping and matching strings uh, as BASE is doing. We could also do some deeper textual analysis so for example, if somebody says, you know, I love uh, pruning trees and uh, you know, that sort of thing, chopping things down, uh, that could be associated with the term you know, gardening. And then you might be asked to uh, help with clearing a yard or digging. Uh, you're more likely to be interested in it than somebody who wants to spend all their time you know, doing uh, um, like writing software. You're, right, you're a more outdoorsy type. So you could do sort of deeper analysis. And there are tools that are already out there uh, like the Stanford Parser and Open Calais, which uh, people can leverage uh, to do this kind of thing fairly easily. You don't have to be a, a natural language expert to do this. 
Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is reputation and accountability. So these are big issues in uh, time banks. You want to know when you transact with somebody, especially when they're providing you with a service, they could be relied upon to say what they're going to do, uh, to, say, to do what they say they're going to do, and to do that with a reasonable quality result. So, um, you know, what you kind of want is some information about that person, uh, what their skills are like, what they've done in the past, so a kind of digital resume. Uh, this is the kind of thing that I was saying, it would be great if you could share this between systems as well once you've created one. Uh, this is an example taken from Bay Area Community Exchange. This kind lady gave me permission to show you hers. So she has a nice description of herself. And then you can see the transactions she's engaged in in the past. And not only that, but you can see who she's engaged with and who she's engaged with repeatedly. So you can read this account in a more sophisticated way and say, OK, you know, people seem to like working with this person. They come back for uh, more of her services. So uh, you know, that's, that sounds like uh, somebody I can work with. Another thing you can do is to um, uh, put you know, metadata on top. So ratings is the obvious thing to do. <clears throat> we actually added this to our mobile app in the first incarnation. But there are some problems with ratings. So if you're in a time bank, you can't really, I mean, I certainly couldn't feel good about like giving my neighbor a one star review for something that I didn't like that they did for me, right? I've got to see that person every day. So we want to be a little bit more sophisticated and maybe you know, restrict somebody to a budget of one star a month so that you know, usually you don't give out a star. You only get a star for a really great performance. It would be something a little bit more sophisticated like that. Um, Another thing we can do, and this is, uh, we tried to demonstrate this last summer. Um, so Greg Norsi is an intern here at Park, and uh, Emiliano de Cristofaro uh, was managing him, and, and uh, they collaborated with me last summer. What we were trying to do was uh, try to make the profiles that you see on dating services more trustworthy. And so we developed this, uh, this is really Greg was leading this, I should say Greg really did all the work. He developed this thing called Certify, and uh, so Certify would take information out of a Facebook account. For example, it doesn't have to be, it could be LinkedIn. But this is information that's much more difficult to fake. So the idea is to use information that's very difficult to fake, that can be checked up on, and then present that in this uh, dating service. But this could also be in a time bank, right? So it would be quite easy to fake a time bank profile if you just joined. Uh, but if you have to rely on information that's already out there, it's getting more difficult. And um, this also, of course, as I said, saves time. You only do it once if you can reuse the information. Um, so that approach of uh, using information from another service also applies in the case of physical uh, safety as well. So um, you know, you, when you're engaged in these digital transactions with people that you don't know, it's especially important, it's if, especially if you're frail, you're inviting a stranger into your house. And so you want to make sure that this person is not a criminal. So this authentication is a really, really important issue. And in fact, because it's so important, time banks actually do security checks. You can't just join a time bank in general, uh, you know, because people have to be able to trust the other members. And so uh, as well as actually helping people assess each other's profiles, uh, by doing this kind of authentication, by borrowing from other social media, you could help the people, the volunteers who are doing the security checking. Because I don't know how they checked me. I joined about five or six time banks all around the country. And in some cases, they said, oh, sure. And in other cases, they were like, who are you? You don't live here. So you know, they're not always necessarily able to check on everybody in enough detail and uh, to be sure people are who they say they are. So um, one thing that we could do also is, uh, as well as thinking about the safety of the people who are uh, having others come to their homes, is worry about the safety of people who are providing services. So uh, you, know, you go out into the community. You may go into neighborhoods you don't know very well. And uh, you don't know what you're up against. And uh, this is actually a, a little screenshot from uh, uh, crime, crime Reports. And it's showing Sobrante Park which is right in the middle of uh, a very um, uh, high crime area of uh, West Oakland, sorry, East Oakland. And um, uh, we found out to our cost that this was a, a real problem spot. So two of my students who were collecting data for me were sitting on the steps of the church using a smartphone and a laptop, which they were after about 10 minutes relieved of by a gang of uh, teenagers, I think they were, armed with a gun. Right? Now this has never happened to me before. This was terrifying, very shocking. 
Um, and you know, we realize this is a significant issue. You can't be out there using expensive devices and, and you know, in a neighborhood like this, expect to get away with that. I mean, there's a lot of crime there. So if they'd had some notification, you know, like alerting them to these kinds of things that happen, they might have uh, you know, exercised more caution. I, I'm sure that they would uh, never make that mistake again. Uh, oh, another thing is that if it wasn't possible to integrate with a service like this, in fact, a very small tweak to the mobile app would actually be possible. So you could uh, not just be posting requests and offers, but you could also post you know, incidents or alerts. Uh, and as I said, you know, uh, uh, nextdoor.com, there's a lot of people communicating on that all the time, alerting their neighbors. So it's a natural, it seems a very natural practice for people to just say what's going on. So you could imagine Time Bank members actually posting you know, uh, events where they see them happen, and over time you get a pretty good picture of what a neighborhood is like. Um, so coordination, that's another issue that's kind of interesting and problematic. Um, so uh, typically when you, you know, you're trying to arrange to, uh, to have a service exchange, uh, you need to figure out the time and the place to do it, you know. Uh, also, the, the, both the recipient and the provider have to be coordinated quite a lot of the time, especially if it involves transporting the recipient, for example. So, you know, you know scheduling can sometimes be a pain as well. So being able to integrate with things like Google Calendar, or if it's for gardening, you might want to have easy access to look at the weather forecast when you're scheduling. That's, that's for today, but we are really concerned about scheduling because of our mobile app has some different sort of properties to it. So, you know, we uh, want to uh, have people be able to schedule things like on the fly uh, and very short notice. And so, um, you know, the instant that somebody realizes they have a need, then we want to find somebody who's in the right place to, uh, to provide the service, right? <clears throat> so we want to look at where people are and maybe where they're going so that we can divert, divert tasks to them. Um, so, you know, that's not far out now. There are a lot of services out there that are uh, collecting data about where people are. So this is Foursquare. There is automated check-in apps so that you can say, every time I'm here, just check me in automatically. Uh, there's things like Waze, um, which, you know, absolutely relies on people reporting where they are. Um, there's also uh, Google Now. But that, has anybody not heard of any of these things? I, I assume that you're all quite tech savvy. Um, Google Now uh, also builds up a profile of uh, uh, where people are and what they're doing. And so, you know, applications like these are springing up all the time. And, and everybody is a sort of in a, a data haze, I guess. There's all of this information being collected about you if you have a smartphone. And the great thing about these, or if you ignore the fact that it's a little bit scary sometimes, uh, is that they have open APIs. So you can go in there and leverage that data. And I think for the purposes of time banking, it might make sense to do that. And so uh, what we'd like to do is to be able to have people agree to have tasks directed to them as a sort of recommendations based on uh, where they are. But not only that, because some of these systems are doing quite a sophisticated job of building models of their owners, to where they're predicted to go. And so, uh, for example, now you can uh, divert a task to somebody because you know that their regular commute will take them past the dry cleaners and past the uh, dry cleaning's owner's place, you know, and they'll be going past before it closes, right? So you can divert tasks on the fly on that basis. So you're not just using somebody's skill set, you're not just using their personal profile, you're also using their behavior all as a way to filter and target tasks. So that's, that has to happen for time banking to get as efficient as, as I would really like it to get. And uh, we have a, a group here run by Oliver Broditska, my colleague, uh, who is looking at this kind of thing. So they're actually very interested in uh, looking at people's behavior patterns and trying to predict uh, where they're going and uh, when would be a good time to uh, send them notifications or recommendations. So, in this case, uh, we have a little scenario is being depicted here. So the user uh, regularly picks her daughter up from uh, ballet school at a certain time of day, uh, and she's uh, uh, predicted to be going there today, and it's uh, getting close to closing time. She's going up, uh, the ballet school pickup is at six, and she will just make it if she leaves now uh, uh, and she can get to Harry Turner's office and he's an insurance agent. She needs to meet with this person. And so uh, the system can say, okay, now is a good time to send this reminder that she needs to meet with Harry Turner because she can do it on her way to ballet. 
And so uh, it doesn't deliver the notification randomly or as soon as it realizes this is a possibility. It's going to time it for just before she sets off, before she gets distracted with driving. So uh, that's the kind of challenge that uh, Oliver and his group are trying to address. Um, so then uh, the last topic I just want to touch on briefly is in this sort of space of uh, participation uh, and being uh, acknowledged for your participation as well. So um, for the first one is just uh, how do we get people to uh, uh, try out try time banking if they've never tried it before, right? Especially young people. They've probably got no idea why anybody would want to work, do some work for somebody else. They wouldn't recognize the fact that actually one of the main uh, ways in which people can feel uh, happiness is actually by helping other people. But that's something you learn as you grow older. So uh, what you can do, and uh, has anybody not heard of gamification yet? You've all heard of gamification. So yeah, it's, uh, is, is putting a, uh, uh, something uh, on the front end on the experience to make it more fun from a kid's point of view uh, or from a young adult or somebody who just likes to have fun. Make it competitive, add points, do teaming, have competitive comparative data. And uh, that's just a matter of user experience design rather than, again, you know, the intellectual or the, the smart stuff that's going on at the back end. Uh, I should say there's a lot of intellect actually goes into gamifying things, and uh, uh, I know that myself. Um, so then another thing is tracking the hours. This is a, um, something that gets in the way of participation, and uh, so it takes time even now. Uh, we've had one or two people uh, mention that it's a, you know, an onerous thing that you have to remember to do. But just imagine if you are in a future where time banking tasks are happening all the time. You know, you go to the supermarket and you do two or three of them, and then on your drive on the way back, you stop off at different people's homes. How on earth are you going to keep track of all of that stuff? And so, you know, we want systems that are a little bit more intelligent about uh, uh, tracking when people are likely to be doing time banking tasks. And so, again, you know, Oliver's group, and, and I've collaborated with him. Uh, on this in the past is trying to do more about activity inferencing. So using sensors to infer what somebody is doing. So uh, you, know, you can use location as a really big cue. If I'm in the supermarket, probably I'm shopping. If I'm in the gym, probably I'm exercising and not the other way around. And uh, you know, if I'm uh, uh, like jogging up and down, then maybe I'm walking. And uh, so I can maybe uh, like a, a develop a model of what some tasks might look like. For example, dog walking might look you know, a certain way, or digging a yard might look a certain way. There may be some things that uh, uh, it's hard to disambiguate. But at the very least, it's probably likely that you can detect activity boundaries using some of these cues. And at least you know, when you know that somebody was supposed to be doing a time banking task at a certain time, you could at least have a pop-up ready that says, did you just start the task? Or did, did the task start at this point? So the user doesn't have to fill in all the information. They can just pick from some guesses that the system might make as to when they were working on the task or not. So that's it. Uh, one last thing I should say about systems like this, of course, is that you know, users should have control over all of the inferences that systems can make. You know, if systems are making, uh, collecting a lot of data and doing all of this inferencing, it should be up to the user to at least say, you know, yes, you are allowed to use this to infer what kind of activity I'm engaged in, uh, you know, d during these hours and not at other times. So, you know, I, I am concerned about those kinds of issues. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, thank my collaborators. Uh, it's been a real pleasure working with them so far, and I'm very excited about the work that we've been doing and uh, looking forward to doing more of this. Um, we're actually start, we're getting to the point now where we're about to begin tackling some of these issues I've been talking about. But I encourage other people to join us, participate in this research, write proposals. I think it's a great area. And I'll just conclude with uh, credit to uh, four people who uh, provided some of the information that went into the history here. The, the many students who helped me collect and analyze the data, and to Ian Grieve for his uh, uh, artwork. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, one, uh, why have I never heard of time banks before? And uh, two is how do you how do you establish the value of the currency? So how do you establish that 
it, how, is an hour of my time worth the same an hour of your time? Right. Um, so the first one, why have you never heard of time banking before? Well, I should say I'd never heard of time banking before uh, I got interested in the idea of uh, organized reciprocal altruism. So I don't think it's been well enough promoted. Um, and uh, I, I am hoping that it's, this is something that's going to start changing now because there's a few people, myself included, who are very passionate about this and, and trying to do more to, pr to promote it. So you've heard of it now. Uh, no, no excuse for not investigating further. <laughs> um, it's an alternative currency, and you asked this question about uh, how do you establish the value of uh, an alternative currency. Um, so, well, how do you establish the value of the dollar? Because now it doesn't really, it's not tied to anything, right? It's sort of a confidence uh, game. So, you know, if we all agree that the dollar's worth a dollar, um, whatever that is, then, you know, we'll continue to act like that. But every so often people lose confidence, and, and so, you know, the dollar loses its value. And the same thing with uh, these, these currencies, you know, is they, they're valued at whatever people believe them to be valued at. Um, I guess the, the special thing about time banking is that it's meant to be an hour of time, you know, so you have to be able to believe that somebody spent an hour doing something, which may mean that there's a certain amount of, you know, co-producing the, the report as to how much time somebody spent. Because actually the way the systems work is tends to be that the provider says, I spent three hours on this, and then the recipient says, yes, you know, that, that's true. And that way, you know, between the two of them, then, you know, you're not getting uh, fraudulent uh, reporting of hours. Now, that could be abused, but uh, I've never heard of it being abused. And if time banking becomes a lot more popular, I think we're going to have to go a little bit further in, in terms of making sure that, you know, hours are really hours <laughs> and they're being reported accurately. But yeah, it's whatever, whatever makes you believe something is worth what it is. <laughs> Um, thank you. I, I have heard of time banks, and I'm really glad to hear you're doing all this research. It seemed like part of his question was actually um, not whether you worked an hour, but you know, if one person's a lawyer and one person oh, yes, is cleaning right. a house, you know, do you value them equally? And yes. is that part of the principle that yes. it's time? Um, so thank you for clarifying that. And I apologize, I, I wasn't here at the beginning. So, but if you wanted to try out a time bank, how would we do that? You mentioned that you're part of five or six. So how do we get started? Um, so right there here. are time banks in this area. There is, uh, so as I said, there's the Bay Area Community Exchange. Uh, but that tends to be focused up in San Francisco and in uh, Oakland. Um, then there is one around here that's being started by the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. Um, I know that they're still busy with that because they actually have a social scientist who is uh, studying that. Uh, if you go to... Um, Go online and just search for time banks and then whatever your neighborhood is, just as, you know, like describe it in increasingly uh, uh, large geographical terms, you'll probably hit something. There's quite a few um, on the West Coast, but there, you know, there's, there's definitely not one in every neighborhood. And um, also, you can start your own time bank as well. Um, so the uh, Our World uh, uh, software is very easy to set up because it's all run off one server. So you're essentially just sort of creating a new Our World um, uh, site. Some of the other ones require you to have a bit more technical expertise because they, they'll give you a copy of the software and you kind of configure it yourself. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's, there's probably opportunities for time banking in this neighborhood. I wouldn't be very surprised if you won't find one. It sounds like the total number of hours provided is equal to the total number of hours used mm -hmm. in the normal setup. And I'm wondering if there's ever a need in any of these uh, communities to print new hours in some sense, to sort of generate extra hours out of, you know, out of thin air. And is there any notion of an interest rate or anything like that? It happens. Um, so, you know, the, the time bank will often issue people hours for attending meetings, for example, you know, just for participating and making decisions and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, they, they can just, like the, the US government can print dollars, a time bank can uh, issue hours if it wants to. And, uh, and I said, you said, you know, that there are, you know, for as many hours ex uh, spent as earned, but like I say, people do tend to hoard hours and it tends to slow things down. And I, I talked to somebody who was very uh, uh, interested in the economic side of things and he was complaining bitterly about this 
tendency for people, you know, not to want to go into the red, and, and it was actually slowing things down considerably because people, once they've they've overspent, you know, they're two hours in the black in the in the red, they don't want to do it anymore, and that. You know, well, that they, there could be potentially lots of transactions they could engage in that don't happen thereafter. So that is an issue that has to be dealt with. So I'm absolutely intrigued by the fact that the more people are in black than red, because it's unusual for many different things that were freely available to have more people in black than red. And I was wondering if that's because a lot of people just try it out and then give their service because they think it's a good thing, a kind of charity to the community, and then kind of lose their interest and not participate anymore. So is there any study about the time since they have joined time banks and how the balance changes over time? Um, yeah, I'm not very familiar with that kind of data. Uh, so the qual qual quantitative data, there's somebody called uh, Ed Collum, who's been doing a lot of research on the quantitative side. So I couldn't definitely answer you as to what the typical profile is. It's, it's like anything else. I believe that um, there's a small number of people who are very, very committed, you know, and then like a long tail of people who are far less uh, engaged and only engage in a few transactions. Uh, and, and it's, yeah, I don't really know, understand how it works in the sense of, you know, if the time bank is uh, uh, providing services to elders, for example, uh, in some cases, you know, if they're providing all of the transportation to and from doctor's appointment, are the elders contributing or are they, or is the time bank simply issuing the time to these people, you know, and, and not involving the, the people who are getting the rides in that equation? So I, I don't know how they resolve some of these uh, uh, details, to be honest with you, and I haven't seen enough of uh, the, the quantitative data, although we're now getting to the point where we're hoping to uh, see more of that as we integrate with the, the Our World platform, we will actually be looking at more of the quantitative side. But uh, as, as I say, Ed Collum is the person who's done the most quantitative analysis. So I recommend that you chase up his work. We're just gonna take three more questions. Thank you, that was an outstanding presentation. Um, obviously the egalitarian aspect is very appealing. The use of time as a specific measurable unit uh, makes sense. My question, I'm coming at this from an interest in collaborative intelligence and how do you make task-oriented systems work? And it seems to me that when you have, uh, when you grab hold of time as the, the central unit of measurement, you um, constrain the system in such a way that there would be certain potential, and I would uh, hark back to your gamification slide. Mm -hmm. In other words, the gamification aspect is gonna offer certain rewards. You need some sort of system for designating what, uh, what those rewards are in some kind of units. And I'm wondering if those units, it would be adding another level of abstraction, but if that wouldn't provide a huge amount of additional flexibility to the system. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot for designers to do. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, behavioral economics and persuasive computing and gamification, all of those things that we can do, you know, to sort of like better understand what will get people to be engaged and uh, encourage them to participate. And I, I mentioned early on in the talk that, you know, this, uh, uh, the time banking metaphor was kind of added later on uh, uh, before uh, uh, or after a lot of these places that uh, were around the US were engaged in these informal exchange programs. And I think that in some cases this might have hurt uh, the exchanges because of this problem with the banking metaphor and the debit, people not wanting to go into this, uh, the, the, the red. And so there may be other metaphors that do work as a, you know, a service exchange, which is you know, something that means that people who are uh, uh, receiving services could actually sort of think of what they're doing as providing opportunities for other people to create value, you know. Uh, and so if you think about it in a different way, that might actually speed things up. So I'm very interested in uh, that, that design space. But I don't have all the answers, you know, we're just starting. Actually, uh, I'm delighted that you have taken this topic. It's just wonderful. So thank, thank you, you for the information. Um, I was curious that, um, at least from my experience, the time bankings that I have come across, 
they are mostly in a distressed communities or they have been provoked by lack of economic prosperity. And if we want to advocate this level of um, alternative, so to speak, currency, um, how could you, from your study, or have you come across, uh, how could we incentivize the communities that are more prosperous, but mm -hmm. yet they can get engaged, or perhaps to do a cross-functional, i.e., between a community that is in a distressed economic situation and a community that is well-funded in some fashion? And I can understand from some of the questions uh, that if someone, if someone is a surgeon, they don't want to be paid the same if they are, I don't know, cleaning the lights, for example. Right. So if you, if, I was wondering if you have come across that kind of a solution, hopefully. Thank you. Um, no, I don't, I don't really have uh, solutions for a lot of these questions. Um, I, I'm concerned about this issue of, uh, of participation of certain segments of the community. I'm concerned about the fact that, yes, you know, it does seem to be associated with communities where uh, there is uh, uh, economic deprivation, basically, or subsections of communities. So elders, for example, you know, uh, are much more drawn to it because they now start to depend on each other and they realize as they're getting older, they're going to need more help. So people, you know, sort of so far have been more um, seeing this as something that is a backup and, and it's sort of like a, another way of making sure that you're okay if things get bad. I think, though, that uh, if we make it more like Facebook and we try to make it more engaging, I mean, people spend a lot of time socially grooming on Facebook, you know, and, and actually getting out there and doing something, right, is better for you for a start off. And, you know, it serves the same purpose. You're sort of like, you could be interacting with people, forming relationships with people, getting to know your neighbors. We just need to sort of, uh, I think, sort of position it right, like make some tweaks, make it easier for people to see what's going on in the time bank, uh, make it easier for the time bank to see what's going on in the community. And I say, some of this is software. I also think that it would help if we promoted it more and that governments could begin to see what value it has and actually did encourage people, you know, maybe you can get some tax breaks for participating in, in time banking. There could be some policy issues there. Uh, another thing is, for, is to get schools uh, and educators uh, to think of this as a, as a way to learn stuff, right? Uh, and what better way to learn uh, things rather than sitting in a classroom is to be out there doing it, being tutored by somebody, you know, like an elder, elder who can no longer fix a car can have somebody fix their car while they tutor them, you know. So there's all sorts of possibilities here. I mean, elders and kids, you know, used to spend a lot more time together in the his in history than than today. I think now, you know, like uh, this is an opportunity for kids to help elders and learn from elders, and and this could be built into their curriculum, you know. So I just think that you know we need to be imaginative, and and certainly looking ahead to the future where resources are dwindling, you know, and we have to start to be more efficient, I think time banking is a great way to really make a, a communities more sustainable. Yeah, I, I wanted to just um, sort of um, ask a question or, or maybe sort of make a point that, that a lot of these time banks, when I first encountered them in the 1980s, they were on, on three by five index cards and they were very community based. So people knew each other and, and so it didn't have this, this sort of horrific connection to uh, this financial sector that, that is now being imposed on it. I mean, when people talk about interest rates or something, it makes my, my, my skin crawl when we talk about sort of banking time or whose time is more worth than, than another person's time. And you, you sort of threw up the slide to crime reports and, and it sort of brought up that same thing, right? That crime reports sort of reiterate these kind of negative stereotypes about neighborhoods that then get uh, where services then are withheld. Like I used to not be able to get taxis to my door because I lived four blocks up from a project and, and nobody wanted to, it was sort of, the, that was the neighborhood. So it sort of seems to me that as, as you develop these software solutions and you're trying to sort of think about how to scale this up which is sort of the big ambition, right? Like mm -hmm. chain, APIs that can exchange things so that we can have a global time bank. The, the danger is that all these old uh, afflictions that are 
that we are living with every day where people are not getting the services they need because they live in the wrong neighborhood or because other people think that their time is worth more than other people's times, they seem to be creeping in there. And I, I guess I would just sort of be curious to, to, to hear what, if any, thought you've given um, that idea of not perpetuating those same models. Yeah. I mean, I think any system that you set up will inevitably have some shortcomings and failures. And, and you know, I certainly can't guarantee that time banking will solve all problems or be free from, you know, some of these societal ills. Uh, I, but just looking at the way things are, I mean, you know, many time banks are thriving in these uh, uh, economically challenged areas. The people who live in those areas are the ones who are doing the time banking with each other. They don't care. To hell with the people who are, you know, outside. We're helping ourselves. We're, you know, helping our neighborhood. And so they're, uh, you know, providing each other with lifts and, and all the rest of it. So uh, I think for that reason, because it's neighbors helping neighbors, that's one of the catchphrases they use, uh, this issue about people not wanting to come into the neighborhood and provide help sort of goes away. And in fact, you know, you don't need the government to help either. You know, you are offloading a lot of those things that people expect usually to get from social services. They actually are providing them to each other. Um, so, you know, and I can't predict how, how the details will work out. And there may be, still continue to be, you know, I pointed to that slide where there was many, many different systems, you know, not just time banking, but credit sharing systems and barter systems and, you know, e-currencies and all this sort of stuff that's out there. I think that picture's going to continue to get even more, you know, complicated. And uh, what is going to win? Will there eventually ultimately be a Microsoft or an Apple of, you know, uh, social reciprocal altruism systems, I don't know. Uh, but if there is, then maybe we will all standard or standardize around one way of doing these kinds of exchanges. And, you know, maybe those problems will then become, e they'll either go away or they'll become entrenched and there'll be nothing we can do about them. <laughs>